where are you? There's a uh, there's a big room. Yeah, so this is where I, we are. The transcript works out of. So it's kind of what we. Yeah. So nice. we have like a Mac lab in our school. And that's what we use. So Northampton in Massachusetts. Yep. Cool. Uh, so I have uh, six questions for you, if that's all right. That's and... it. That's all you got. You got six questions. And, and yeah, we're... they're like they're like two and a half. They're like two and a half minute segments. Uh, oh, so okay. we usually try to keep because our viewers, we try to keep it like brief. So you want me to do six questions in two and a half minutes on Flat Earth? Um, no, it's kind of. Uh, you can just talk and I'll cut it down and everything. Okay. Okay. Because yeah. about to say it's a it's a fairly big topic and. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is kind of like an overview. We uh, we do our best to try to kind of cover like, um, not like the entire thing, but you know, different. Got it. Sex. Got it. So how much how much time do I have blocked out for this? Um. When just, when do you when do you have to get out of here? Uh, I have as much time as you need. Perfect. Yep. Um. All right. So. Uh, so real quick, could you uh, before we start the interview, could you just uh, say and spell your full name? Sure. My name is Mark K. Sargent. That's S-A-R-G-E-N-T. And I'm uh, just north of Seattle, Washington, on a little island called Whidbey, W-H-I-D-B-E-Y. All right. Perfect. All right. So the first question is, um, it's kind of a, uh, what shape, what do you think the shape of the earth is? Perfect. I, oh, I'm sorry. One more. Sorry. One more thing. I forgot to say. That's um, right. could, if you could kind of like rephrase the question. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. What? Right. Yeah. I, I know where you're going with this because you don't want your voice on the thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Of course. Uh, I think the world is shaped like a snow globe, like a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. You are living on a flat area in the middle that's surrounded by water all the continents are basically islands and this gigantic pond the north pole would be the center of it like a like the center of a dinner plate and all the continents would be spread out fairly organically around the outside and um the only continent that doesn't look like anything else like a, like it should be would be antarctica so on a globe, Antarctica would be a, a place like kind of like Australia, only covered in snow. And we say that Antarctica is this giant, massive landmass that surrounds the, the complete outside of this place, which holds the water in. And you're saying, well, we're, we're, you're like in a flying disc through space. No, you, you might as well be living in, a, again, a snow globe, a planetarium, a terrarium, a pizza box. And all the world's a stage and you're in it. There you go. All right. Perfect. The second question is, uh, what a mate, what originally made you doubt the globe earth model? Hard drugs. No, no, that's not true. Uh, what made me doubt the globe earth model was that I had looked at just about every conspiracy I could think of, decided to finally look into flat earth because it's the worst conspiracy of all time. Everybody knows it's a globe, right? We've known this since we were kids and your father and their father going all the way back before your family tree can even be tracked. And so I said, oh, okay, I'll shut this thing down in a weekend. And I looked at it from a court of law perspective. Can I prove the globe in a court of law? It's like, well, everyone's going to lean on NASA because they're, the, they're the, the only real source. They're the only ones that have actually gone outside of this world and looked back and said it was a globe. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized that all those boxes of information that NASA had were basically just empty cardboard containers. And that the, the space program since the beginning, since NASA was uh, created in 1958, it's all just been stagecraft. And if NASA's wrong and all the physics and engineering behind it are wrong, then the world isn't what we think it is. Uh, that and the, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you five quick, sorry, let me do this. There was a, uh, a German television team that asked me, it's like, come up with five, five, five science questions for a physicist. So I'll, I'll give you the, the five really fast which was, uh, first one would be long distance photography. If the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile per mile, looking off into the distance, remember it gets worse as with distance, then eventually you shouldn't be able to see things on the other side of the curve, right? But the only limit to the photography we have now with HD cameras is the thickness of the atmosphere. That's it. Uh, number two would be gravity versus the vacuum of space. That's an easy one, which is... How is our atmosphere still here? 
well, you're going to say gravity. Gravity's holding the air down. It's like, oh, okay, fine. Put a um, put a vacuum chamber above you in any capacity, or you can look it up online. It's been done many times. Pull the valve on that. Tell me what happens. Instantly, violently, the air will equalize and go upstairs right now. Okay, so if gravity can't keep the air in your room from going up, how is gravity keeping our atmosphere still here? And you say, well, well, it has to. It's like, no, unless it's a pressurized system. You're covered in a dome. You're in a big, giant terrarium. Uh, three would be, no, three, third one would be the um, uh, the moon eclipse shadow. That's always a good one. The moon's supposedly 2,000 miles wide, but the blackout zone, which in fact, actually is going to be coming near you guys pretty soon. Uh, the blackout zone is only 70 miles wide, which coincidentally is how big we say the moon is. Shadows only are equal size or longer. They never, ever get smaller. We can't do that down here, but apparently that's that's what the case. So 2,000 mile shadow down to 70 miles? No. Uh, fourth would be the uh, moon temperature. You can go out and test this with a little point and click infrared th thermometer like this baby right here, uh, 20 bucks or at a hardware store. Um, you all know it's cooler in the moon, in the sunshade, but why is it warmer in the moon shade? And buy that up to 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Why, why would it be warmer in the shade of the moon? The moon is generating a cold laser light. And you're saying, well, that doesn't prove a flat earth. It's like, well, no, but it destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon because people say the only reason the moon's lit up is because it's reflecting the sun. And last but not least would be the, uh, the Van Allen radiation belts, which were announced by NASA in 1959, give or take. Uh, by Van Allen himself, an NASA employee, and he said, "Oh yeah, you can't you can't go up there. It's super super deadly bands of radiation. No one should ever out, go up there ever." And it's like, okay, well then the Americans immediately started creating a space program, and they went through it six times. Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody got cancer. There's still four of those original guys walking around today. So are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? It depends who you ask. If you ask NASA, it's like, oh yeah, they still say they're really really deadly, and they can't even test their Mars program capsules because they can't solve the radiation problem. And the reason why I bring that up is the capsules, the only thing that stops radiation are gold, which is twice as dense as lead, lead, and a whole bunch of water, which we use in power plants. And uh, you don't use that in aerodynamics at all. So there you go, long version of the thing. The, the, be, those five questions I threw at a Georgetown uh, physicist and he just folded up, that was it. He was like, nope, we're not doing this. And he backed away from the interview and no one's come at me since then so all right all right the third question is um what has been your experience with the scientific community it varies the it depends what level of science you're talking about here Any oh, oh real quick could you rephrase the question oh right right what experience uh have i had with the scientific community it depends on their level of education mostly uh if they have a bachelor's degree in a physical science they're much more receptive. If you have a master's degree or higher, you know, like PhD in physical science, you won't touch this with a 10 foot pole for the most part. I mean, yeah, there's a few guys out there, but you got to remember when you get up at that level of education, you've spent so much time and money and are so worried about peer review and being published. And the, the scariest word in, uh, in the academic world is ostracized, which means you're just kicked out of your, of your circles. No one wants to touch it. So for most of the people in science, it's beneath them. It's absolutely, it's like, why are we talking about this? It's it's a known thing, which I've got to bring up. Um, And I know you, you're you probably smart enough to remember uh, George Orwell, the guy that wrote 1984. He, he said back in 1946, and he wasn't one of us, but he, he wanted to mention that everybody believed whatever anyone in a lab coat says. And he said, you know, it's weird. You can go to every, anybody on the street right now and ask them how they know, you know, how do you know the world's a globe, right? And they'll just say, what are you talking about? We know. It's a known thing. It's like, really? How do you know? You don't have a spaceship. You haven't been up there. How do you know? You got to remember, 1946, that was 12 years before NASA was even founded. How did everybody in the world know it was a globe in 1946 if, if no one went up there, right? So my, my point to the science community is this. I, I And one of the reasons we've been so successful, I mean, we have a 99.9% .9 retention rate, is because science has co never come up with a counter version, because we've come up with a very easy model of how to explain the world, right? That you're basically living in a snow globe. There's no space. There's no stars. It's just lights on the ceiling. You're in a planetarium, right? Science thinks it's beneath them to even discuss it. And which is like, okay, fine. Like in your school, the math club and the physics club, really, really small compared to like, you know, the band 
and football and all this other stuff, right? Most of the people in this world are not intellectuals. And if the intellectuals don't want to come at us and try to debate us in any way, shape, or form, it's like, fine, we'll win by attrition. We'll go around you. We'll just flank you on both sides, take everybody else, and then, then in the end, you know, you'll be outnumbered. And then what are you going to do? There you go. Right, great. Um, the, uh, the fourth question that I have here is... Um, what is the biggest misconception about being a flat earther? The biggest misconception of being a flat earther would probably be that we are as dumb as rocks. Uh, there's something you'll eventually run into down the road. It depends if you get in a debate called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which was a PhD paper, which was basically an expansion of a childhood insult. So like in a playground, you probably heard this when you were growing up uh, called, you know, you're, you're too dumb to know how dumb you are, right? Or you're too stupid to know how stupid you are. That's what the Dunning-Kruger effect is, which is like flat earthers are so ignorant that they don't even realize how ignorant they are. That's probably the most in, uh, common misconception. It's like that they're all morons. It's like, are you kidding me? I, I have some of my best friends, which are all flat earthers are extremely articulate, extremely smart, extremely motivated and dedicated and professional. And yet that's the, the most common misconception because, of course, flat earth is the dumbest thing ever because of the conditioning that you have gone through for a number of years. Look, it's the only thing we debunk to children, by the way. We don't talk to children about JFK or 9-11 or Pearl Harbor or the moon landing or any of that crap, but we'll, we'll put a globe in their classroom, put it in the corner of the room, they'll leave it there for 12 years. That's incredible conditioning right underneath the American flag. It's brilliant. So, and by that, the conditioning, I'll, I'll give you one more real quick. Most common misconception, we'll expand on this just for a sec, is that we don't know what we're talking about, right? And so, I, and I'm not, this is rhetorical. I'm not going to throw this at you. You don't have to answer this, which is how fast, for anyone that's listening to this right now, how fast is the earth traveling, spinning on its axis? How fast is it traveling around the sun? How fast is the solar system moving sideways through the galaxy? How fast is our galaxy moving through the universe? 99% of the people I ask that, that aren't in our circles, they don't know that, right? They know what we do. So the question is, why are you defending something you don't know, right? We know about, more about the solar system and the universe than you do, because we had to re-memorize, because everybody started out hating flat Earth. That's, I'm sorry, one more misconception is everybody in flat Earth like jumped on board for no apparent. No, we all started out as globalists. We all started out hating everybody. It's like, oh no, flat is the stupidest thing ever. You started the negative and then worked to the positive. So there you go. Sorry, I ramble. Oh, good. Uh, the fifth question is, um, do you ever encounter conflict because of your beliefs? Do I ever encounter conflicts because of my beliefs in flat earth? Yes, I do all the time. That's that's part of the job. That's what we do. Uh, we uh, constantly deal with people's questions. Uh, I mean, the, the, the reason why we spread out there and, and get into just about every platform you can think of, and we've been doing this now for nine years, is, in fact, not, the clues are nine years old today, as a matter of fact, um, is because... Everybody starts out asking questions and people have to go through the five stages of acceptance, you know, uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. And so that's what we have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. So yes, friends and family and coworkers, you will have to face down all those questions all, all the time, all the time. I mean, I mean, the fact that you're asking me questions now, imagine that every day for nine years, this is what I've been dealing with. Yeah. Lots of conflict. All right. Great. And the sixth and final question is, in the age of information, what do you say to those who claim that the abundance of scientific data disproves your worldview? Wow, I'd have to repeat all that. In the age of information, how do I explain all the scientific data, all the proof that's come at me? How do I how do I just wave that off and say it, it's it's not worth anything? Uh, it's easy because we, again, everybody in our community starts out leaning on that information to keep us away from flat earth. Nobody likes flat earth. I leaned on NASA. In fact, I was one of the, the longest holdouts. I hammered on this thing for nine months. I leaned on science. I leaned on physics. I leaned on astronomy. I leaned on NASA. Did everything I could to stay away from flat earth. And the more you stare at it, the worse it gets. 
until finally, again, in February 10th of 2015, I, I just woke up and it's like, okay, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to ask the internet for help, which is I'm going to put a series of clues out there, put a series of videos with all my contact information of how you found me, as a matter of fact, and say, okay, internet hive mind, you're really, really smart. I mean, people are dumb, but the hive mind misses nothing. Tell me how I'm wrong. Tell me how it's a globe. Tell me how you can prove the globe in a court of law. In fact, if you want to take it one step further, see if you can do it without using the word NASA. Because you remember, NASA is, yeah, they they wear white uniforms and smile for the camera and don't carry guns, but they are DOD completely. Department of Defense have been since the beginning, founded on the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. So is that who you're taking for credibility? So there you go. That Yeah, everything NASA does is fake. And science, unfortunately, because they're not up there. Remember, there's only 500 people that have ever claimed to have been to space, and they're all military. Uh, science just doesn't know any better. They, they've they just built on the shoulders of everybody else, and nobody checked the bottom level to, to see if it was right, which was, oh, yeah, by the way, you're living in a snow globe. There you all go. right. Great. That is all my questions. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Yeah, yeah. Happy to do it. If you need anything else, let me know. All right. Awesome. I will. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. See you.